Um, we're going to make a little bit of a change in the back, um, and while he's making that change, we're going to play some a couple of really short little videos, and I'm going to play them first, and then I'm going to explain what it is, but you'll probably get it. that let's see good okay hi there um, you rolling Chris okay so um, all the first three of those videos were from Eastern Ohio and it was from uh, a family that lives near a compressor station and those were the the first two were blowdowns, and I think the third one was basically just kind of the normal hum. It didn't sound like a blowdown. And then the last one was from a compressor station in Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania. So blowdowns are extremely loud. The first one you saw, the, the dB meter, so you can see it was like 80 dB, and the house was maybe, I'm estimating it was a quarter of a mile, maybe you know, 2,000 feet, something like that. 
That's maybe closer to half a mile. Okay, so we're going to talk about your, your uh, the pipeline that's in your in your backyard, and the compressor station is coming. The pipeline is here. The compressor is just comp just proposed. Thank you for correcting me on that because there is a chance that you can stop it, but you have a lot of work to do. Okay, there's my name, email address, and phone. I'll make this available to you if you want later. There's two compressor stations I've really examined very closely, and one is the Williams. Both of them are owned by Williams, and. Uh, one is this one, the, uh, the Dunbar compressor in Windsor, New York, and the other one is called Williams Central Station. It's in Susquehanna County. This is from a, I took an airplane ride. I have a friend of mine that has a plane, and we go fly over compressor stations. I know, that's kind of a weird hobby, but. Um, so one thing I want to show you is, oh, here we go. These right here, who knows what these are? Those are dehydrators. Those are glycol dehydrators to take water out of the gas. These are, I think they're, re, uh, these are the reboilers in the back here. These what boil the glycol. These look like block valves. Uh, the black right here are the exhaust stacks from the engines. The engines are in this building. And then the other, these long, funny things here, these are actually coolers. And there are some coolers that being, are being installed in various locations that are pro part of this new market expansion. Um, there's a, a smaller one. This is Auburn, uh, Susquehanna County, yes. Um, there's the Williams Central Station. This one actually, believe it or not, in horsepower wise, is about the same size as the proposed one for your area. And just, I mean, it's hard to get a sense of scale, but those are people right there. And let me see if I can find, that I think is a truck. So this is a really big honking facility here. Um, it's big, so it's, I think this is a, I think the total size of the site is 50 acres. I'm not sure if it's totally populated right there. That's maybe looks like about 30 acres. There's another one, William Central Station. Same one, pretty good contrast there. This is just kind of a compendium of a bunch of them. One of my favorites is that one, UGI Auburn. It's kind of an art deco, you know, sometimes they try to make these things look like not so industrial and that, I don't know what that looks like, but um, it's just weird. <laughs> um, this one right here, this is an interesting one. This is a, a compressor station that's associated with a gas storage facility. I'm going to tell you in just a second um, the various places you find compressors. I'm really changing the order up, and I've really none of us really had a lot of time to prepare for this, so I'm sorry if I'm kind of jumping around, but hopefully uh, you're going to get like an overall understanding of things after this is all done. $160,000, Bradley and Megan Hayes at 86 Patterson Road in Windsor, New York. Look who purchased the property, Williams Field Services. Very beautiful home, new construction. There's a little play set where the kids played and maybe a tree fort back there. And they left so fast, they left the kids play fort there. Um, the reason why they left was because Williams said that, I don't know if anybody was here for this presentation last night, but one of the neighbors of this facility was, gave a talk. And, um, Basically, uh, before this facility went in, uh, the town of Windsor passed a noise ordinance, and, um, and Williams, the operator, said, well, you're not going to see it, you're not going to smell it, and you're not going to hear it. Uh, but in fact, they never could meet the requirements of the noise ordinance. I'm a resident of Windsor, New York. I'm writing in regards to this case. Laser was the name of the pipeline before Williams bought it. The compressor is located half a mile of more than 40 homes. This has already been the cause of a very serious incident. Cloud of gas was ignited by lightning, a huge fireball. Uh, they've not installed an alarm system, high levels of noise to reduce property values. Windsor's current noise ordinance should be respected and obeyed. Please do not allow any expansion. We are unable to sleep at night. 
Here's another complaint. Noise levels are unacceptable. Um, this is next door to the house I just showed you. Uh, haven't had any success in keeping with the town noise ordinance. There's no warnings of the blowdowns. We cannot leave our windows open because of the noise. This is actual complaints of people that live near. And here's another one. Blew off pressure one night at 3 a.m. It woke us all up. Thank God my son heard the noise. He sleeps with the smell permeated his room. So this is really an important point that you hear the gas industry commonly talking about, oh, how great the regulations are, uh, therefore their operating procedures are going to be safe. Well, here is a prime example of where the gas company involved, Williams Company, cannot make their facility meet within the regulations. They can't do it. It's not possible, or it's not economically possible. Maybe they could build a, a bubble around this facility, but in fact, the cheapest solution is that people abandon their homes near the facility. Look at this, okay? This is actually from Williams. This is from the company that operates the compressor station. Um, they were asked to supply documents. Four different units, they've since expanded it to five or six, I forget. 56 blowdowns in one year from one unit. 51 blowdowns the next unit, 48 the next, 72 the next. What's the total of that? 50, 100, over 200 blowdowns in one year? You heard how loud they were on those videos, right? I'm sorry? One about one, one about every, every day and a half. Yeah, and wow. Um, okay, so let's get into a little technical talk here. Uh, I, fluids are not compressible. Oil pipelines have pumps. Gas pipelines have compressors. You have to compress gas to move the gas, which you already heard before. Um, there's three different types. Reciprocating engines, pistons, driven by piston engines. Gas turbines, uh, which power centrifugal pumps. And as uh, Larissa told you, uh, electric motors are the best, and they power the centrifugal um, uh, pumps as well. Um, you might get glycol dehydrators. I didn't see that in the application. You might get cooling. Some of the facilities along this new market expansion get cooling. There can also be slug catchers. Slugs are um, like drops of water that get into the pipeline. They're very bad for the pipeline, so they have to get the water out. Uh, Larissa also told you about pigs. There could be pig launchers metering and block valves. This is a pipeline distribution network. So, you know, a lot of us here in this room might be wondering, why, why, do, why are we getting this thing? What, what, how does this fit in? What's the, what's the reason? What's the system that's going on here? This is the whole system. Um, down in Northeast PA, generally, we have the gas supply, the Marcellus supply is mainly coming out of just a couple of counties in Northeast PA. Gathering lines, go to a compressor here, then we go to um, like a transmission line like the Dominion. We can go to underground gas storage facilities like the one in Owego, I showed you the compressor for that one. Uh, and then we can go to, this is like a little storage facility that's used for, it's called peak uh, shaving, which um, in peak demand they can give you gas from this thing or from this place. Um, and then finally to local distribution networks. Um, this, is, this is a high pressure system right here. This is a low pressure system. Uh, we can have field compressors. Those are those little ones that, um, in Susquehanna County. Um, they're basically just vacuum cleaners that suck the gas out of wells that are uh, aging. And there's lots of them. storage field and in line. What you have here is you have an existing pipeline. There's no new taps coming off that I can see in the, in the, in the application. So this is basically just an in-line compressor. 
Uh, the new market project is expected to come online in 2016. That's what they think. Uh, we'll provide Marcellus Gas to customers of two local distribution companies. What I'm going to show you is there's some inconsistencies in what um, Dominion is telling you all versus what they're telling to FERC uh, and, uh, and to their investors. There's the centrifugal blower which is powered by that thing. There it is, that's a cat. I don't know why they call it a solar. Are they just trying to be funny? I don't know, but if there's nothing solar about this thing, this is basically, that's a jet engine. Just like you have a, a jet in an airplane, just about, and then there is that big centrifugal pump right there. And then on the back side of this thing, along this, this axis here, there's gonna be, I think we just looked it up, four, little electric generators. This facility proposed is going to generate electricity for its own consumption, for its own use. Um, guy in Australia, well, this is what he says. Basically, this whole thing is about adding capacity. There's so much gas being produced in Northeast PA, they have to get it out to get to market, to make money, because these gas companies are carrying a big debt load because they borrowed a bunch of money to get these rigs in here, and then the gap, they overproduced and the gas price plummeted. Wait a minute, Bill. Are you telling me that the exploration and production companies are all losing money because they overproduced and that drove the price down? So they want to create new markets to sell more gas at deflated prices to recoup their losses? That doesn't make any sense. Well, I agree with you, but this does appear to be what the gas industry is doing. So my only explanation is that maybe Wall Street's answer to every problem seems to be increased production. So anyway. So they need to add capacity. What are the three ways you can add capacity? Well, you can do pipeline looping. I just learned this last night that this particular section of the pipeline near you is already looped. There's two parallel segments. One's a, one is a 30 inch. And one is, I think, a 20, 20 inch? Okay. And then the other way you can increase capacity is by increasing the MAOP, maximum allowable operating pressure, which means put more pressure in it. But as we're gonna show you, that might be a bad idea for a pipeline that was built in 1965. Um, big picture, this is basically the root of the new market project. Here is, this is where we are right now. And that's Horseheads, that's Ithaca. This is uh, Utica. Uh, basically, Horseheads is getting a new compressor. Let's go to the next slide. Horseheads is getting an 11,000 horsepower compressor. Proposed. There's a proposed, thank you, thank you. Um, cooler is going into Ithaca. Cooler is because when you compress gas, um, it gets hot. And when you push it through a pipeline at greater pressures, it creates, the friction creates heat. Um, so there's, um, here's the shed's proposed uh, compressor. Here's a cooler in Utica. There's an 11,000 horsepower compressor at Brookman's Corners. And what I'm gonna show you in a second is there's the Iroquois pipeline runs this way. Uh, and that's why you have a compressor there at the junction between two pipelines. And then there's also a customer in Schenectady, a local distribution company that's getting some gas. Brooklyn, Brooklyn Union's getting 82,000 uh, decatherms per day from this proposed expansion. And Niagara Mohawk in Schenectady is getting 30,000 decatherms. Here are the pipelines. See this yellow one here? The yellow one with this kind of the shadow. This is the Dominion. And then there's quite a few other pipelines. This is the Iroquois. The red here, this is the gas field. This is the place where the gas is being produced in the red zones. There's some other pipelines that are in this area. Um, there's a bunch of proposed export terminals. There's actually about 30, not all of them are on here. What also isn't on here, look up here. Do you see any up here? Uh-uh, I don't see any up there. But in fact, there's two. One is in St. John, it's called the uh, Canaport Import Terminal. It's being flipped. There's also a new proposed facility associated with the gas storage field at Sable Island, Nova Scotia, that's getting, that's proposed. It's looking like it's gonna get one. 
export facilities. The Iroquois can be used to export gas to Canada. National Fuel has a connection at Niagara Falls to export gas to Canada. And Cove Point, Maryland is a, just got their permits, uh, at least the federal permit. Who owns Cove Point, Maryland? Dominion, same company, huh? Uh, there's Cove Point, they're selling to Japan and to India. So America's fuel, this is supposed to be America's fuel of all this gas, right? It's going to India and Japan and a bunch of other countries. This shows the Canadian connections a little bit. I'm gonna fly because I'm running out of time. Um, oh, the reason for this one is, look up here. The pipelines get connected up here. What's going on up here? Alberta. Tar sands. Tar sands is a huge consumer. We think of it as a producer of stuff, but it actually consumes two things. Natural gas liquids, because they use natural gas liquids to make, to, they also call it condensate, to make dilutant, because the tar sand, the bitumen is too heavy. It's, they can't be moved in a pipeline, so they have to add dilutants. And the other thing is, there's a lot of heat they need to generate to purify this bitumen. So they're, you know, they're actually reversing the Iroquois pipeline. Remember this one, the Iroquois? That used to take gas from Canada down here. They are reversing it to go this way. So we can imagine that some of our gas might be going here. The, uh, here it is, Iroquois, north-south, uh, open season. Oh, by the way, one thing I wanted to tell you was that uh, Dominion is a 25% owner of the Iroquois pipeline. This is from the application uh, for this project right here, Shed's Compressor. 54,000 tons per year of, green, of CO2 equivalent. This is the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, to give you an idea, okay, you've all seen a railroad car like this, a coal car, 100 tons. A unit train is 100 cars, that's about a mile long. Each unit train, do the math, 10,000 tons. 54,000 tons is a coal train how many miles long? Every year, a coal train five miles long worth of stuff going into the air if they run this thing at full capacity. The hum, we heard about the low frequency sounds, right? Uh, th this guy has done research into low frequency sounds being emitted by pipelines and compressor stations. Um, one thing that's interesting is in this fact sheet and also in the application, I can't find any record of what is the, what, three things. What's the operating pressure of the Dominion pipeline right now? Anybody know? What's, gonna, what's going to be the operating pressure after this compressor station? What is the maximum allowable operating pressure? It's not there. It's not in the application. It's not in the public record. It's there, they submitted it, you can't see it. If you look at the application, there are about five appendices that are missing because they are labeled critical energy infrastructure. It's secret. But that's an important thing, the pressure. So one thing people might want to ask themselves is do I live in a high consequence area? I think most people should know that, like they know their own zip code. Evening, flames roared some 60 feet into the air as block after block in this residential neighborhood, about five miles from San Francisco's airport, were engulfed. Because there's a lot riding on it. When these pipelines break, they're very spectacular failures, and they have great potential for injury. Now, to be able to answer this question, we have to know certain factors about the pipeline, such as the maximum allowable operating pressure, the pipeline diameter, and also the population density of the area. Now, what I will tell you is that people who live in more densely populated areas generally get greater protections from pipeline safety law. I don't think it's right, but I'm telling you, this is a fact. So I read in the 14th Amendment in the Constitution that there should be equal protection of the law, but apparently that doesn't apply here. The bottom line is, for people living in rural areas, you are considered by law to live in a sacrifice zone. 
until we fix the law. That's not to say that living in a city makes you safer, as these images of San Bruno reveal. So the first part of answering the question, do I live in a high consequence area or not, involves calculating the potential impact radius of the nearest natural gas pipelines in your area. And this radius is expressed by this formula. Note that you need to know the diameter of the pipe and the maximum allowable operating pressure of the pipeline in order to do this calculation. If the MAOP is kept secret from you, like Dominion is asking FERC to do, then you don't know. You can never answer the question, do I live in a high consequence area? So this is Sissonville, a 20 inch pipe with a maximum allowable operating pressure of 1000 PSIG. You can see the predicted blast zone in red and in yellow the actual area that was burned. The yellow area does exceed the red area by 17%. This is Cleburne, Texas, a 36-inch gas transmission line, maximum allowable operating pressure of 1,051 PSIG. I calculated the potential impact radius and used Google Earth to assist me calculating these distances. Anything within about 300 feet of the pipeline rupture was vaporized, like this poor tree here. Notice that the calculated potential impact radius was 825 feet. However, we can see many secondary fires extending out almost 1,400 feet. Just as a point of reference, 1,400 feet is just a little shy of five football fields end to end. So in summary, the actual blast radius is commonly over the predicted potential impact radius. So if you live near one of these pipelines, you might want to take the calculated potential impact radius and double it just to be safe. Because here we saw in Sissonville and Cleburne, the calculated or predicted potential impact radius was off by 17% in one case and 70% in the other case. Check my math here, folks. So here's the bottom line. Without knowing certain details about the pipeline, for example, the maximum allowable operating pressure, or the diameter, or the type of welds, or the results of hydro tests, maintenance records about cathodic protection, pigging history, corrosion and other inspection results, etc., there's no way to perform an independent safety audit without this information and this information is being actively hidden from you by a collusion between FERC and industry. There is no good reason I can see to hide this information from public view. Allowing it to be secret at industry request hides critical information necessary for citizens to assess the safety of the proposed facility. I suggest that the legitimacy of this scheme should be vigorously challenged and you should demand that FERC provide you with this information. So here's the Lathrop compressor station and uh, Williams owns that in uh, Susquehanna County. It went kerblamo. Uh, this is the one in, in uh, Windsor, New York. It blew up twice. Uh, this is the Sissonville. You maybe saw the video coming in. The Sissonville, it was a 20-inch pipeline. When it blew, it blasted a crater and it destroyed, it melted I-77. It destroyed the highway. They had to completely rebuild the highway. That's Sissonville. Here's a chunk of the pipe. One thing I want to tell you about is there is a kind of pipe, an old pipeline like this. LFERW, welding low frequency electrical resistance welding it was a common practice before the 1970s. So if this pipeline was built with that kind of pipe, this is what can happen. It just, the welds, they self-destruct over time. This is the Williams Central Station in Brooklyn Township, Susquehanna County. After it blew up, psh, all pipelines are subject to corrosion. This is a fact of nature, right? All pipelines corrode. 
This is Barlow's formula. Barlow's formula is used to derive the maximum allowable operating pressure of a pipeline as, as the, which one, as the thickness. T is the thickness. If you reduce T, who's a math major? If you reduce this one, what happens to this? It goes down, the maximum allowable operating pressure. So as pipelines corrode and age, the operating pressure should go down. Now look at this. Where's the math major that answered my question? We got the safety factor is in the denominator. So if the safety factor goes down, what happens to this? It goes up. So if we reduce the safety factor, we can fudge it. We can fudge it to try to get more gas through it. So the science says as a pipeline ages, the maximum allowable operating pressure should go down. But industry wants to make more money, mo money. So guess what, PIMSA, um, uh, PIMSA is the pipeline safety. We have, this is one thing too, FERC makes the permits, PIMSA does the safety. They're separate agencies, so the safety isn't taken into account when granting the permit. That's one big problem. Guess which one, which way does the safety uh, part of the, of the government go? Do you think they go this way? Or do you think they go this way? They go this way, they go this way. They should go this way, that's the, what the science says. Um, they try to stop corrosion. This is the alternate MAOP. I'll tell you about that during q and I'm, I'm getting the signal, so thank you very much.